Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Seven Days of Science. This week's episode marks the 300th Seven Days of Science, and so to celebrate, we've brought all three presenters together to film. Missed time that, haven't we? <laughs> Thank you so much for all your support with this series over the years. It really means a lot to us. And we are so glad that you've been enjoying the recent additions to the show. I, I don't, um, anyway. Anyway, in the... In, you, no, you don't. No? Anyway, in the headlines. For this... This week, in, in, we've uh, got a, yeah, a study documenting some mysterious prehistoric trackways in southern Africa. More evidence for the Neanderthal hunting and butcher... No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> More evidence. <laughs> More evidence for Neanderthals hunting and butchering elephants. An interesting new hypothesis suggesting a link between dinosaurs and modern mammal aging. Plus, plus, m- much, plus more. much more. Plus more. I am genuinely Starting off the news this week, scientists in the United States have revealed the detection of the second highest energy cosmic ray ever recorded. The findings, published in the journal Science, use data from the telescope array experiment based in Utah, a state in the western US with a high amount of desert, allowing the hardware to cover such a large area. These rays were detected in May 2021, and only cosmic rays discovered in 1991 eclipse their energy. Most high-energy cosmic rays come from nearby galaxies, but there's something a little odd about those detailed in this paper. The researchers should be able to more accurately pinpoint their origin because of how high energy they were. Strangely enough, this has just raised more questions, as it seems as though these cosmic rays originated from an area of space called the local void seemingly empty space that lies to the side of our own Milky Way galaxy. It doesn't seem to originate from a galaxy at all, and has no obvious source. The researchers suggest that such incredibly high energy particles may experience some as yet unknown physics when they reach those levels, or perhaps that the foreground magnetic fields that you would expect not to have much of an effect on high energy cosmic rays actually do. Either way, this is an incredible discovery and brings about a rather more incredible mystery. In other news, we journey back into our own solar system for a look at Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn. A study published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has looked to confirm the detected presence of amino acids within the icy plumes that erupt from its surface. As the study acknowledges, Enceladus is an incredibly interesting body in a solar system for those looking for the possibility of life within our sun's sphere of influence. It's previously shown promising signs of containing the necessary elements under its surface for life to potentially begin. By spewing its subsurface material out past the surface, scientists are able to get a better picture of what it might be like underneath the moon's surface. In this study, researchers have conducted lab experiments to try and prove that amino acids could survive ejection from the moon, with all the forces they would have to endure to do so. They have successfully done so, which supports the data that was sent back from NASA's Cassini spacecraft that suggested there was indeed this material present in these ice plumes. An incredibly important study then in confirming some incredibly exciting data from Cassini's mission. Up next is the fantastic news that a new species of living hedgehog has been named. Belonging to the genus Mesokinus, which was known from four species living in China, Mongolia and Russia, this new fifth species inhabits eastern China and has been named Mesokinus orientalis. It's the only member of this hedgehog genus to live in eastern China and is therefore geographically quite distant from all the others. It's the most similar to Hugh's hedgehog from central China, Mesokinus huey, but is smaller, has shorter spines and differs in the anatomy of its skull. Mesokinus orientalis split off from its relatives about 1.1 million years ago, and just goes to show that there are still new mammal species out there to be found, which is pretty wonderful. Also in the news, Sunday saw the first official health day at any COP meeting. Health is possibly not the first thing that one thinks about when climate change is mentioned, but human health is intrinsically linked with it. An example of this is dengue fever, a tropical disease caused by mosquitoes. 
In countries where dengue is already widespread, climate change is prolonging the high-risk season and its range is increasing with cases being seen in the past few years in southern Europe. Globally, the number of cases has risen dramatically. In 2000, half a million cases were reported to the World Health Organization. In 2023, that number has risen to 4.5 million. Scientists are developing an early warning system called e-dengue, which aims to predict outbreaks two months in advance. By combining insect surveillance with climate forecasts, scientists are developing ways to predict and prepare for new disease outbreaks. Predictive models are being produced using data from a variety of sources, such as satellite images and weather stations, to gather meteorological information. Drones will help identify pools of stagnant water where mosquitoes breed, and researchers gather information from local communities and health officials. The idea is that communities will be able to take preventative measures and so reduce the risk of an outbreak, rather than having to deal with a crisis, thus saving lives and resources. First up in the paleontology news for this week, there's been a study that has investigated the range of motion in the forelimbs of the bizarre little theropod Mononychus. This dinosaur, a member of the Alvarosaurids, is well known for having just one functional digit on each hand, bearing a claw that was likely used in digging for insects to feed on. Although the range of motion of the forelimbs of this dinosaur has been looked at before, this study uses a corrected and improved technique to see how exactly all of the bones move relative to each other, showing that previous investigations had underestimated the range of Mononychus forelimb movement. Instead of only being able to move them in a small arc and having to sprawl out its arms permanently, it could actually flex them much more than was previously thought, and could even tuck them into the sides and sprawl them out to make the palms face downwards. So, this better supports the idea that Mononychus and its relatives were probably using these arms to dig at things in order to access insects inside, and they had actually had a much wider range of motion to do this widge. Widge? What is widge? That's not a word, it was the world. That was the last word. What is a widge? And they actually had a much wider range of motion to do this with. Also in the news this week, a major new study has been published that has investigated the rise and fall of the crocodilians and their relatives. The larger grouping that living crocodilians belong to is called Pseudosuchia, and the paper explains that although there are fewer than 30 species alive today, the fossil record preserves more than 700 different extinct species that were incredibly diverse and filled all sorts of different ecological niches across the 250 million years that they they existed for. This new study therefore uses a massive new super tree of Pseudosuchian evolutionary relationships and the times at which they existed in order to look at how and when these animals underwent extinction events as well as radiations of new species. They found that certain biotic and abiotic processes correlated to the timings of these events, such as higher global temperatures resulting in speciation events in terrestrial marine lineages, but higher global sea levels being associated with increased extinction rates in non-marine lineages. Times of increased competition also seem to correlate with heightened extinction rates in non-marine groups, but then greater competition appears to have driven both extinctions as well as speciations in marine pseudosuchians. This research is therefore incredibly important for understanding how various factors can influence the evolution and extinction of different animals, and highlights the usefulness of taking into account both rates of speciation as well as extinction. The authors also note that it's particularly important to show how the fossil record can tell us so much about the climatic factors that can lead to the success or disappearance of various lineages at a time when so many species are facing the effects of anthropogenic climate change. So, a fantastic new study. Up next in the recent paleontology news is a study that has investigated evidence for marine snowstorms that occurred during the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, the so-called Great Dying, the most severe mass extinction in our planet's history. The authors explain that the Permian-Triassic extinction is marked in the geologic record by significant excursions in carbon isotopes that were likely triggered by major increases in organic productivity. But there's a strange absence of organic carbon-rich rocks in a lot of sedimentary rock records from marine shelf environments around this time. This research, however, has looked at one of those rare places where anomalously carbon-rich rocks from this point in time do occur, 
at a site in New Zealand, and they've shown that these sedimentary rocks actually comprise many unicellular and colonial phytoplankton that grew during algal blooms, and then subsequently fell as marine snow, a term used to describe organic particles that fall down into the deep ocean from higher up in the water column. Modelling the impact that ash from all the volcanic eruptions in the Siberian traps would have on productivity in the ancient ocean, they found that the ash would actually have fertilised the waters with phosphorus and iron, causing the algal blooms and resulting marine snowstorm that contributed to the major carbon drawdown during the extinction. So a really fascinating look into the impacts of this intense volcanism on the Permian Ocean. There's also been a very intriguing hypothesis published this week in the journal Bioessays, speculating on the effects that dinosaurs might have had on the biology of modern mammals. The author explains how the evolution of ageing in mammals may be linked to the origination of the group during the Mesozoic, when dinosaurs dominated many of the ecological niches of the planet. Whereas some reptiles and amphibians age relatively slowly, and sometimes actually do not even show ageing phenotypes, mammals that have longer lifespans experience a very marked ageing process. The author hypothesises that the evolutionary pressures placed on mammals during the Mesozoic, when rapid reproduction was being selected for, resulted in genes and pathways associated with long life becoming lost or inactivated. Naming this the longevity bottleneck hypothesis, it therefore states that although extended lifespans can evolve in mammals, as it has in humans, it does so under biological constraints that could date back to the time of the dinosaurs. It's a very interesting idea that obviously needs a lot of testing and investigation to prove, but it seems like a fascinating hypothesis to look at further. Next up in the news is the very exciting publication of a paper documenting two new sites where Neanderthals had hunted and butchered straight-tusked elephants. A study from earlier this year had shown that Neanderthals hunted and processed the bodies of these giant herbivores based on remains found at a locality in Germany. And this new study has now examined two more sites, also in Germany, where Neanderthals were again apparently performing this behaviour. The sites date to the last interglacial, about 125,000 years ago, and they show that the hunting of elephants was not just a localised practice and was in fact widespread among Neanderthal communities, as the butchering patterns were similar to those at other sites too. The study also shows that, based on how much effort would have been required to process these enormous carcasses, as well as the huge quantities of food produced from the butchering of the bodies, Neanderthals might have temporarily come together in much larger groups than we had previously thought, or maybe had some sort of way to store vast amounts of meat. The authors say that the current data doesn't allow them to rule out either possibility, and it's also possible that both occurred. The presence of three different places where the hunting and butchering of straight-tusked elephants therefore shows this to be a widespread, repeated phenomenon among Neanderthals of the North European plain that lived during the last interglacial. And the acquisition of so much food was undoubtedly an important event in these people's lives. Woo! And finally for the paleontology news this week, there's been an interesting paper published that describes what are apparently the oldest bird-like footprints in the fossil record, and they come from the Upper Triassic. These footprints are preserved in rocks of the Late Triassic to Early Jurassic aged Clarence Formation, which you might remember Doug and I actually visited when we travelled to South Africa and looked at a dinosaur trackway there ourselves. These bird-like tracks actually come from parts of the Clarence Formation that outcrop in Lesotho, and they do indeed show all the features of bird tracks. However, the oldest known basal bird body fossils are only known from the middle to late Jurassic, so these tracks are significantly older, by about 60 million years. The paper discusses all the potential track makers, such as small non-bird theropod dinosaurs with very bird-like feet, maybe small ornithischian dinosaurs, or potentially some kind of unknown archosaur group that convergently evolved foot morphology that left tracks very much like a bird. It's an intriguing paleontological mystery then, and hopefully one that will be solved at some point in the future. And it's pretty exciting to think that we might have the tracks of an unknown archosaur lineage here. Well, that's it for the news this week. I do hope you enjoyed watching uh, everything, and thank you for, <laughs> for all the support that you've uh, given Seven Days of Science over the more than five years that we've actually been doing this show. And uh, it's been really nice to see the response to Amelia joining the team. Yeah, thank you. It's been really lovely. Except the comments on my lipstick. <laughs> and poor, poor Poise. 
And how do you say porpoise? Porpoise. <laughs> Did you not say porpoise? Probably. Porpoise. Apparently, is how it's meant to be said. But porpoise. there's an o. Oh, it is porpoise, in isn't it? I don't know. I like to say porpoise. Porpoise. Well, you're yeah. wrong. It doesn't I, matter I, what I, you I like agrees. to say, does it? <laughs> like, I'm sticking with porpoise. I like to my... say dinosaur. Well, I don't. Well, yeah, I suppose. You know. Diplodocus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for all the support you've given us throughout um, the last 300 episodes of this show. Um, and thank you for all the support you continue to give us as we have developed the show and look to develop it further. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed watching. And as always, we'll see you on Sunday. Bye. We actually, we actually will. Yeah, I've got video planned. So. Unless something happens. <laughs> I hope not. No. It's a very exciting video. Yeah, Keep no, no. an eye out. Everyone's been asking for this one. <laughs> Talking of dinosaurs. Yeah! <laughs> yes! <laughs>